So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Top Tens. I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about 10 formerly enlisted soldiers who weren't what you'd expect. And as with all the videos on this channel, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our handsome writing team. That being Ian Forty, you can follow on their socials below if they provide them to us. But let's get to it, shall we? If you ever want to waste a few hours of your day on a frustrating task, try to find the last time in history during which no wars were being fought anywhere in the world. It's extremely hard to do so and folks suggest that there hasn't actually been a time in recorded human history where there wasn't a war, which is depressing. And with so much fighting afoot in our history, it stands to reason that many people have been involved in that fighting. In modern times, there's an official process for this in most countries, which requires citizens to enlist so they can be formally recognised as soldiers. But not every formally enlisted soldier is exactly who you think they are. For example, consider these 10 examples. Number 10, Wojtek was a soldier in the Polish army and also a bear. And this is probably one of the most recognizable entries on this list. And if we didn't mention it, everybody in the comments will be saying, why didn't you mention Wojtek, the Polish cavalry bear? So let's get to that, shall we? Animals and war have a long history. Horses were used well before we had motorized vehicles. Elephants had their day and dogs still show up in fields of war all around the world. But most of these animals are not officially recognized as actual soldiers with rank. Some, however, rise above. A Syrian brown bear named Wojtek was given the rank of private in the Polish army during World War II. It was a group of POWs that first discovered the baby bear in Iran as they travelled through the mountains from Siberia to Egypt. They carried the bear with them, feeding and caring for it, even as their release was negotiated and they were sent to Italy to fight with Allied forces. Wojtek grew up with the soldiers, even learning to smoke and drink beer, which obviously not the best habits for a bear to have. It also learned to carry ammo boxes during battles on the front line, though soldiers would later state that it was only carrying spent shells, not live ammunition, as you'll see other people insist online. The bear also learned how to salute, how to march, he wrestled and boxed, even played soccer. He even became the company's morale officer, for obvious reasons, because bear. Like, they even eventually took on a bear holding artillery shell as their insignia. He was eventually promoted to corporal. After the war, the company went to Scotland and Wojtek joined them. He helped around a farm and continued to play with his comrades until the company disbanded. Wojtek then spent the rest of his life in a zoo and it's reported that his uh, former comrades would visit the zoo and he would recognise them, wave and salute and they would respond by throwing him a bottle of beer or packet of cigarettes. Um, the former of which he would drink, the latter of which he would eat. Moving swiftly on, number nine, a six-year-old girl was enlisted in the Royal Navy in Australia. The armed forces of any country are subject to seemingly endless chain of rules and edicts and procedures. There are codes of conduct, formal definitions and regulations, and all kinds of red tape and bureaucracy around even the simplest of things. Some of it is remarkable nonsense too, but at least the same nonsense can be manipulated in a pinch. For example, in 1920, there were strict rules for the Australian Navy regarding who could and could not be on board a military ship. For instance, under no circumstances was a woman allowed on board, although the Navy itself simply says civilians could not board. This would not have been a problem until the day Nancy Bentley was bitten by a snake. We all know Australian snakes are not to be trifled with. Nancy was just six years old and a snake bite could have very easily been lethal for her. Worse still, she and her father were nowhere near a hospital, but they were close to the HMAS Sydney on Australia. Australian warship. Nancy's father rode her to where the ship was docked and begged for help. Captain Haley knew regulations would not permit the girl's treatment on board, but it would allow a sailor to be treated. As such, the captain ordered the girl to be formally enlisted in the Navy and she was brought on board. The girl was given the rank of mascot and received first aid treatment before arrangements were made to get her to a proper hospital. And for anyone curious, Nancy survived the ordeal and eight days later was officially discharged. Number eight, Just Nuisance was an official sailor in the Royal Navy and also a dog. So several dogs have saved lives during wartime. We've probably talked about them here on this channel and they've performed heroic acts that were later officially recognized. But a Great Dane called Just Nuisance seems to be the only one to officially make it into the British Royal Navy. The dog was raised in Simonstown, South Africa, near a British naval base. The sailors were fond of the dog and would often walk him and feed him treats. He would often sleep on the gangplank of the HMS Neptune because he was so large, almost 6.6 feet when standing on his hind legs. This made him a nuisance to get 
around, hence the name. So how did Nuisance become enlisted, you wonder? Well, by being a nuisance. The dog wanted to go on shore leave with the soldiers when they travelled to Cape Town, but train officials hated having the dog on board. Which makes sense, because big old dog. And they started sending threatening letters to his owner. Some included threats to put the dog down. The sailors, who love the dog, took it up the chain of command. They didn't want to lose the dog either, and their commanding officer, intent on keeping up morale, found a solution. The commander-in-chief of the Royal Navy enlisted the dog. This meant he was entitled to free travel on trains so the rail company couldn't complain about unpaid fares for the massive dog. His enlistment included full paperwork where his first name was listed as Just because it couldn't be left blank. He was given a medical exam and signed it with his own paw print. His official rank was Ordinary Seaman. And even though he never saw combat, he proved to be a pretty valuable member of the Royal Navy. We say this because he eventually earned the rank of able seaman. Nuisance had an accident when he was seven and the Navy was forced to put him to sleep. He was given full military honours, including a Royal Marine firing party, because that's what all good dogs deserve. Number seven, William Windsor was a goat in the British Army. While some animals do well and get promoted through the ranks, that's not always the case. Consider a goat named William Windsor who actually got demoted for his behaviour as a soldier in the British Army. William, also called Billy, was a Lance Corporal with the 1st Battalion Royal Welsh. He could not keep step in a parade in honour of the Queen back in 2006 and was, as a result, demoted to Fusilier. Billy was not the only regimental goat, of course, as monarchs have been presenting them since Victoria's time, in honour of a goat that is said to have let the Welsh soldiers... <laughs> led Welsh soldiers from the Battle of Bunker Hill. Like, that's the, if you're British and, and you know like, the stereotypes about the Welsh and four-legged farm animals, that's just really funny to hear. In 2022, Lance Corporal Shenkin was on hand for the proclamation of King Charles. And this reminds me of a similar story about the ravens that are in the Tower of London. If anyone who's not familiar with the idea of ravens being in the Tower of London, for centuries now there's been a superstition based on like a curse by a witch or something that uh, the monarchy would fall if um, uh, the last raven left the Tower of London. So for many years there has been a person employed by the crown whose only job is keeping ravens in the Tower of London, and those ravens have on occasion been fired from their post as ravens. Um, one example was a raven who left his post to go to the nearby pub to eat snacks and cigarette butts off the ground, which was seen as being unbecoming of a representative of the monarch, and he was replaced by another raven. <laughs> Uh, I made a video about it on my own channel, if anyone's interested, it'll be linked below, it's called like, that time a bird got fired for going to the pub or something like that, but moving swiftly on and speaking of birds, number six, Donald Duck was an official army sergeant. We can safely agree that animals serving in the military is not super unusual, that means we need to kick it up a notch and talk about an animal that isn't even real. We need to talk about Sergeant Donald Duck. As you may have noticed, Donald Duck has always dressed as a sailor. This dates all the way back to 1934. By 1941, he was officially drafted into the US Army, as opposed to the Navy, where he seemed like he would have fit in more, though he found a place there later. In 1942, he appeared in military cartoons as part of the US propaganda machine during World War II. For anyone curious about how this came about, Disney had been losing money in a government contract to make propaganda films, promoting their war efforts was helping them pay the bills. Disney produced several military and patriotic cartoons featuring Donald as an example of a solid American, even paying his taxes in what sounds like just a fascinating and exciting premise for a cartoon. So Donald also became an honorary member of the Navy and the Marines. Though he may not have been in the Air Force, his face appeared on the side of many planes. In 1984, 50 years after being enlisted, the director of the Army staff officially gave Donald his discharge papers and released him from service. And this was after his final promotion to the rank of sergeant. So gutted for anyone in those branches of service who didn't reach that rank to know that they were technically outranked by a fictional duck in his 90s. Number five, Calvin Graham joined the US Navy at age 12. And speaking of the opposite of being in your 90s and being in the military service, the youngest veteran in US history, Calvin Graham, was only 12 when he joined the Navy. Graham had left home at age 11 back in 1941. He sold papers to support himself and regularly read news of the war. The attack on Pearl Harbor convinced him to enlist. To sell the lie, Graham began shaving, trying to get stubble. He faked a deeper voice and then forged papers signed by his own mother and stamped with a stolen notary stamp. Things almost worked until the medical when the dentist saw his baby teeth and tried to give him the boot. Graham countered by stating that the medical officer had already let 14 year olds enlist and that he'd rat them all out if he wasn't also allowed to enlist. Surprisingly, this worked. So Graham became an anti-aircraft gunner on the USS South Dakota. He helped shoot down 
26 planes. Later, the Dakota took heavy damage and Graham got a face full of shrapnel, but he lived and helped his fellow sailors. His mother saw footage of the vessel's return. She called the Navy about enlisting a child and they responded by stripping Graham of his medals, dishonorably discharging him and throwing him in the brig. It wouldn't be until 1977, after years of hardship and additional service and injuries, that President Carter overturned the discharge and restored his medals. Because yeah, it wasn't his fault. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm like 30 years old now, and I look at an 18 year old like I live in a student city, and like they look like children. I can't imagine being in the army and seeing a 12 year old on an anti aircraft gun and be like, well, that's clearly a soldier, right? Now, that, that's clearly a fully grown like, adult dude fighting in this war. It's like, what? Whew. But there's always someone out there going to one up you, and in Graham's case, that was number four, Momsilo Gavrik, who was a soldier at age eight. So you've probably heard a tale or two about a soldier signing up for service before they're 18. Like, we just covered one. This was something that happened with some regularity during World War II, with children as young as 14, or in the case of the previous example, 12 scamming their way into service by lying about their ages. Technically, this is both illegal and frowned upon as we don't want children putting their lives on the line, but child soldiers are far from unheard of. One of the youngest ever was Momsilo Gravik, a Serbian soldier who served at just age eight. As World War I was starting, Gravik's village was attacked and his entire family killed alongside everybody else. Alone, the boy headed out to find the Serbian army. They took him in and moved by his story, officially admitted him to the division. And three times a day, he was allowed to fire a cannon to to avenge his family. Gravik stayed with the soldiers through many battles, even sustaining his own injuries. He attained the rank of corporal, and at age 12, when the war was over, his commanding officer gave him one last order. Head to London and finish school. Again, the image of a small, like, eight-year-old firing a cannon is just... I... Why has there not been a Sabaton song about this? Like, people don't know the band Sabaton, like a heavy metal band who sing about, like, you know, World War II. And, like, why have they not sung about any of these people? Maybe they will. Number three, Jean Thorel was a French soldier for almost a century. So you probably expect most soldiers to be young and physically fit, if nothing else. It probably helps during the physical part of war, like trying not to be shot at or diving behind cover to avoid a grenade. But there is certainly room for people with more years of experience in commanding positions. You want a general who's been through some stuff in charge, not a kid who just read about it. But how experienced are we talking about? Well, in France, it's apparently very experienced. Consider Jean Thorel, who was still busy soldiering when he was 100 years old in 1787. King Louis XVI awarded him the Medallion de Vaux et Pies for the third time. It was given in honour of 24 years of service. He joined the French military in 1716 when he was 18 and served during four separate wars, and was still serving in 1804 when he was 106 years old. At that point, you just what you do, you take you take all the medals he got for like 24 years of service, you melt them down, and you make a new super medal and give him that. And then he's the only one who's allowed to have it. Because I feel like after a certain point, like, you have to recognise that achievement, right? Number two, Monte Gould was America's oldest basic training graduate. So joining the military is typically a young man's game these days. Fresh out of high school is when many sign up, or soon thereafter. But it doesn't always play out like that. Consider Monte Gould, who is an absolute exception, having graduated from the US Army's basic training course at the ripe old age of 59. Gould is a Marine and Army Reserve veteran who went through boot camp for the Marines in the late 70s. He finished the modern BCT in 2020 in the top 10% despite his advanced age, proving sometimes experience and skill beats out youthfulness when it counts. And Gould, to his credit, was quick to point out that it was a hell of a lot easier in his old age and that Marine boot camp would be impossible for him now. So, still, 59 years old. Not bad. And finally, number one. The Mormon Battalion was the only faith-based regiment. Faith and military service have long gone together, but typically in a mostly pragmatic sense. Uh, there are army chaplains, but military service is not guided by any particular religious principle. And in US history, there's only ever been one entirely faith-based regiment, the aptly named Mormon Battalion. In 1846, migrating Mormons appealed to the US government and directly to President Polk to help them. A man named Jesse Little proposed that the president could use the Mormons to defend and fortify the West in exchange for aid. The president agreed and ordered the raising of a 500-man battalion. They would fight in the Mexican War. The Mormons agreed. Though the battalion saw no actual combat, they did endure one of the longest and most grueling marches in military history, clocking in an astounding 2,000 miles. They also had one official battle against wild cattle. Well, that's a story 
for another day. And I hope everybody enjoyed this video and found it educating, informative, and entertaining in equal measure. I certainly did reading through the script. It's always fun to read uh, these top tens. I'm really coming into my stride, I feel. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you've got anything to say about it, my presentation style, any suggestions for future topics, anything we may have missed, let us know in the comments below. Subscribe for more content like this. And as always, have the day you all deserve. Mm. Also, yeah, if anyone's wondering, like, my laptop is always on when I do this. So, like, sometimes I need to check pronunciations and stuff in the middle of videos. And just every now and again, Siri reminds me it's always listening.